This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. As you would imagine, a lot of my friends are also conflict journalists. And I currently have close friends deployed in combat zones everywhere from Ukraine to Syria to Afghanistan to the DRC to Nagorno-Karabakh. And all of them volunteered to be there. It's pretty safe to say that most of these guys and girls have a pretty high tolerance for danger. But of all these far-flung places in the world, there is one country that most of them will refuse to be deployed into certain parts of. And that country is Mexico and its long-raging cartel drug war. This conflict within Mexico, particularly in the north, has already taken the lives of thousands of people and seen everyone from law enforcement to politicians to journalists directly targeted. For journalists, it is the most dangerous country on earth, and the situation has only been getting worse ever since the declaration of the war on drugs. The US and Mexican governments have simply been ratcheting the intensity up and up and up and up throughout this conflict. Mexico now tackles these groups with armored vehicles and drones, but all that's ended up doing is convincing the cartels to buy armor-piercing rounds and spreading out their operations so one drone strike can't take out everything. The US started targeting heads of cartels, even capturing the elusive El Chapo, but all that did is create political infighting inside his group, and create even more violence in the power struggle. Even after the billions spent on US border control, and the record seizures of drugs coming across that border, most experts will explain that yes, whilst capturing these drugs is good, it does get them off the streets, it's a very small percentage of what actually comes across the border. And the most drugs that come into the US come through legal means, like ports or the mail, or as contraband in legal crossings, and go on to burst our bubble by further explaining that Border Patrol catching and seizing more drugs across the southern border more than likely just means there's a larger volume of drugs coming across at the moment, and the Border Patrol is still probably only hitting around the 1-2% to capture mark. In the war on drugs, it's pretty safe at this point to say that drugs well, they seem to be winning the conflict. And the reason they're winning seems so obvious to some, but as the saying goes, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. In other words, military thinking gives you a military solution. If we step away from the law enforcement and military though, what they're missing is something you actually learn in Economics 1101, that with every market, there's a fine balance between supply and demand. And right now the US are doing everything they can to smash the supply side, to stop the drugs from being made in the first place. But as Econ 1101 teaches us, if the demand remains high, but the supply drops, then the price simply goes up. And that new higher price simply encourages more people to enter the market, eventually driving up the supply to meet the demand, completely negating everything the US have just done. As by getting rid of some drug dealers, all they've done is push up the price and encourage more drug dealers to enter the market. The US has ended up spending the last few decades trying to punch their way through an economic problem. And what's even more frustrating is the other side realizes that this is an economics problem. In fact, the cartels are quickly moving to decentralize their models, create cheaper products, globalize their supply chains, and even craft their product to better market to more affluent demographics inside the US. The cartels are approaching this economic issue with economics, and it's pretty hard to say it's not working. But how is this all playing out throughout the country? What impact are our current strategies having on the cartels? And how is economics shaping the overall situation in Mexico? Well, to answer all of that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Passenger or Pilot There have been a lot of variations in Mexican foreign policy over the last 40 years. Sometimes the country has been much more independent of the United States other times more subservient. Sometimes the country has had its own agenda with the United States and the rest of the world. Sometimes it has simply responded or reacted to the American agenda. And currently, uh, under President López Obrador, as a decision of his, basically it has, Mexico has no foreign policy other than to deal with the United States and with American demands as effectively as it can. President López Obrador has not traveled anywhere in the world except to the United States and once to Central America. 
He's now in his almost his fifth year of his term. He has not traveled to Europe. He has not traveled to Asia. He has not traveled to South America. And he probably won't before his term is over. So under this administration, I think it's safe to say that Mexico has only a United States-oriented foreign policy. And that, in turn, is limited largely to reacting to what the Americans say or do. Jorge Castaneda is a professor at New York University and a visiting professor at Sciences Po in Paris. He's the author of several books examining the relationship between Mexico and the United States and also served as the foreign minister of Mexico for several years. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. He hasn't attended a single summit. Mexico's a member of the G20. There have been now five G20 summits since he has been president. He has attended none of them. He hasn't attended any of the summits of the Americas. He hasn't attended any of the Ibero-American summits. And he hasn't attended any of the CELAC summits except the one that was held in Mexico. He goes to the United States because he doesn't have much choice and because that's where his policy is oriented toward. Inevitably, this casts a shadow on Mexico having a policy anywhere else. Uh, simply very complicated to really have a close relationship with South American countries or European countries or Asian countries if you don't visit them and they in turn don't visit you because you don't visit them. I often see Mexico referred to as a two-tier economy. The whilst the North is geared towards manufacturing and exporting, the South is mostly agrarian and much, much poorer on average. Do you think that's a fair categorization? It's a fair assessment. Consulting firm McKinsey wrote a long report about this about 10 years ago, Mexico at two speeds or something like that. It's a little bit of an abstract statement for the following reason. Firstly, these are not symmetrical reasons. The northern part of the country along the border, and let's say 100, 150 miles south of the border, encompasses something like 10% of the country's population. The other 90% is not on the northern border. Secondly, that other 90% is not just the south, it's the center, parts of which is very prosperous, very export uh, oriented, very globalized. It's what in Mexico we call El Bajío. And of course, Mexico City, which con continues to be the most prosperous, the largest, the most globalized part of the country. So yes, I would say rather I would divide the economy not so much into north and south, but rather there is a part of Mexican of the Mexican economy that is globalized, that is modern, that has relatively high productivity, low wages, but not as low as elsewhere. And then a large part of the economy, first of all, which is informal. Uh, secondly, which is uh, not globalized, but largely oriented towards a domestic market. And thirdly, with very low levels of productivity and incomes. Mexico is not a small economy though. In fact, it's ranked as the 15th largest economy in the world. But that brings up a bit of an oddity with their foreign policy, though, as when you look at other countries of similar economic size, like Australia or Turkey or Brazil, those countries all have substantial geopolitical influence throughout their neighborhoods. Mexico, though, doesn't seem to be as influential throughout the internal politics of Central America or the Caribbean, though, as you would probably expect from a country of its economic size. So why doesn't Mexico look to influence its neighborhood like other countries of similar economic size do? Since the 1970s, Mexico has had an increasing role in Central America and the Caribbean. It played an important role in the 1980s when the United States decided it had to fight what it called subversion in Central America and to a lesser extent the Caribbean. It has had several attempts, Mexico, to establish different kinds of economic cooperation mechanisms with Central America in particular and with the Caribbean, either involving oil or electric power, or infrastructure, etc. But in spite of the large cultural influence that Mexico has in Central America and in the Caribbean, the country has never been able to agree to put up any significant amount of money for the objectives it set itself in Central America. Mexico is certainly not a rich country. It's at best a middle-income country. Most of the Central American and Caribbean countries are low-income 
poor countries, but there is no consensus in Mexico, either within the government or within Mexican society, to put up any real money for a foreign policy that is active and constructive in Central America. And without that, it's very difficult for Mexico really to play a role in the region, which it should do. Uh, I tried to do it. I remember my father who was foreign minister in the 80s, tried to do it. But you always run into this wall built up, put up by the finance ministry, which says, you know, you can sing songs and dance and send books and all this stuff that you want to Central America, but I'm not going to give you any real money. Well, if they're not going to send money, why not send oil? Mexico is currently the 13th largest oil producer in the world, and that's leaving many of the deposits untapped. So why haven't they pursued a program like Venezuela's Petro Caribe, where they use their state oil companies to send cheap oil and petrol into the Caribbean in exchange for major influence in their domestic affairs? What stops Mexico from going down a route like that? As a matter of fact, Mexico and Venezuela together back in 1980 set up an oil facility, which was called the San Jose Agreement, because it was signed in Costa Rica, whereby both countries would give a 25 or 30 percent discount on oil to Central America and the Caribbean. And that worked well for five or six years, but it stopped then. The difference, of course, under Hugo Chavez and Mexico in more recent times, the last 25 years or so, is that Chavez could do whatever he wanted and Maduro could do whatever he wanted without being accountable to a Congress, to a opposition, to the media, to anything like that. Basically, it's a, it's a dictatorship. Whereas in Mexico, contrary-wise, the, co- the country has become more and more democratic and the governments have to be somewhat responsive to the Congress, to the media, to the opposition, to uh, civil society. And there is no consensus in Mexico for giving oil away or giving discounted oil to Central America or to the Caribbean. I think it's a a silly, myopic, short-sighted attitude on the part of Mexican society, but that's what it is. Uh, And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to change that. No one has, no government has, no president has, no foreign minister has, and uh, I don't foresee it happening in the near future. I don't think there's any trade deal in North America that elicits more response one way or the other than the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, brought in by Bill Clinton in 1994. This agreement lowering trade barriers between the US, Mexico, and Canada. We quite often talk about the impacts that the agreement had on the American economy, but what impact did it have on the Mexican economy when it was signed? Well, it has had a contradictory impact. The country was already moving in the direction of globalization of uh, trade opening. It started doing that in 1985 when it joined what was then called the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and opened up its economy during the second half of the 1980s. So it was already moving in that direction. What NAFTA attempted to do was to create a sort of insulated area of the rule of law and of guarantees for investment and transparency and accountability, not in the entire country because it was considered that that was simply not possible. But let's say the president at the time and subsequently decided that it was a good idea to borrow the Americans and the Canadians rule of law and establish it in Mexico, at least for foreign investment, foreign trade, etc. This led to the emergence of a very sophisticated, productive, successful, competitive export sector. One generally looks at the automobile industry or beer. Mexico is now the world's largest beer exporter, having surpassed Holland recently. Mexican agriculture has also become highly competitive. The plants along the border manufacture television sets, cell phones, refrigerators, what have you. So in that sense, NAFTA was very successful for Mexico, including in agriculture, by the way, which is often uh, neglected. On the other hand, this affects a very small part of the Mexican society. Jobs directly linked to the export sector only represent about 7% of the Mexican economically active population. That's it. The gap between Mexican GDP per capita and 
the United States and Canadian GDP per capita over the past 30 years since NAFTA came into law in 1994 has grown instead of narrowing contrary to what happened, let's say, with Spain and Portugal in relation to the European Union when they joined the European Union back in the 1980s. For practical purposes today, uh, the gap between Spain and France, let's say, or Spain and the U European Union average uh, has practically disappeared, whereas the Mexican-U.S. gap has grown considerably. So. NAFTA, yes, was successful in one sense and probably was inev inevitable. Probably things would have been much worse without NAFTA and now USMCA, but it has not at all delivered on its exaggerated promises and has certainly not been the panacea for the Mexican economy. The Mexican economy has grown about an average of about 2.1, 2.2% per year since NAFTA entered into law in 1994, which is way below what was expected of it. Well, what about the update to NAFTA, Trump's USMCA? Did this agreement address many of these shortfalls that were present with NAFTA for Mexico? It's mainly filling around the edges with a few important changes. There was a very important change on labor issues whereby in NAFTA was really well just window dressing. In USMCA, there are really labor provisions with uh, teeth in them, whereby labor relations in Mexico have to become transparent, democratic, and supervised internationally by American and Canadian unions, government officials, etc. This has to do with publishing collective contracts, uh, having ensuring uh, democratic elections in factories to see whether they want to unionize and then what kind of union, which union they want, etc. On the environment, there were also important steps forward uh, along the same lines. So those are two important changes. Two additional important changes. One was the more mandatory and expedite a nature of the dispute settling mechanisms, which are actually uh, at work right now on energy and on corn, and also the North American content of the automobile industry, which was raised from 62%, I think, to 75%, which means that more parts of a car that has access to duty-free movement have to be made in Mexico, the United States, or Canada and a lower percentage can come from either Asia or Europe. And that's important because in theory, this will lead to more companies coming to settle in Mexico particularly, and have a larger share of the inputs of the final assembly of automobiles also come from manufacturing industries in Mexico. We'll see if this actually occurs because it could be that the suppliers of these inputs actually come or settle in the United States and not in Mexico. But at least the intention would seem to be favorable to Mexico. One of the largest companies here impacted by these agreements is the state oil company, Pemex. Can you take us through who Pemex is, how big they are, and how much of an impact they actually have on the overall politics and economy of Mexico? Pemex was enormously influential in development of Mexico from the late 1930s when it was founded until the early 90s, and so far as it was the main source of energy in the country and the main source of hard currency in the country. That began to change when Mexico opened up to trade, and today oil represents a relatively small percentage of Mexican air exports. It's much less than tourism, much less than the automobile industry, much less than remittances. It's not that big a deal on the uh, hard currency or foreign exchange side. It continues to be an important source of revenue for the government. The government taxes Pemex at very high rates, which probably could not happen if it were a private 
company or even a publicly owned, a state owned company, but that traded on the Mexican stock exchange or the New York stock exchange, uh, like Petrobras in Brazil, which is a state owned company, but trades on these stock exchanges. It continues to be very significant, not as much as 30, 35% which it, of Mexican state revenues, which was the case before, but it's still up there in the 20, 25% of Mexican state revenues. So it's still very, very significant. The problem with Pemex is that although there was an energy reform in 2014 that allowed foreign investment in oil in Mexico, this has been de facto overturned by the Lopez Obrador administration, which took office in 2000, late 2018. And for practical purposes, uh, there has been very little foreign investment in oil, either in joint ventures with Pemex or on their own during these last five years. Roughly today, Pemex produces about 1.7 million barrels per day, and the private sector, mainly foreign, not all, produces about 100,000 barrels per day. So it's still a very small part. The huge issue with Pemex is that, one, it doesn't have the capability of exploring and extracting oil from deep waters in the Gulf of Mexico, supposing it is there. Everyone thinks it's there, but actually no one has actually found anything yet. Uh, but everyone thinks that there's a lot of oil there, firstly. Pemex cannot do that alone, but the current administration does not allow it really to do it with anybody else. And secondly, Pemex has an enormous foreign debt. It owes about $110 billion. It's the most indebted oil company in the world. And strangely enough, partly for that reason, partly because of its inefficiency, because of its age, etc., uh, these last two or three years when the price of oil has gone through the ceiling and practically every oil company in the world has made enormous profits, Bemex continues to lose money. And it has become a bit of a, an obstacle for Mexican development in general, not just for energy development, but for, uh, for Mexican development in general. And the fact is nobody really knows exactly what to do with it. But where is all this debt coming from, though? Part of it was, in fact, Pemex at the time borrowing for the Mexican government because it seemed at some point that the spreads for Pemex were lower than United Mexican states. That's clearly not the case today. The Pemex uh, has to pay almost twice as much as the Mexican government has to pay right now. It was done to finance losses to finance some exploration that didn't come through, to finance the refurbishing of Mexico's refineries, which are very old and very inefficient. A lot of it probably went into corruption, but it's an enormous debt. It's, as I say, Pemex is the most indebted oil company in the world today, hundred and I think it's $110 billion by now. And service of that debt is very high, even though much of it was contracted at lower, at low interest rates. But right now, Pemex just issued something and had to pay, I think, something like 10% per year. So it, it, it's expensive, and it is a huge albatross around uh, the companies and the country because at the end of the day this is sovereign debt everyone knows it's sovereign debt everyone knows it's backed by the mexican government uh, and that the mexican government will respond for it but that means that the mexican finance ministry has to plow money into pemex every year to help it to meet its commitments on that debt but we were just in the middle of an oil boom where the demand and therefore price of oil was skyrocketing Yet when I look at Pemex's figures here, their peak oil output was back in 2004, and they output much less oil today than they did back then. So why wouldn't they simply raise the amount of oil they produce, sell it into the booming market, and help pay off all that debt while the price was high? Why not pursue that as a solution? Because uh, the oil that would be available, as I mentioned a bit before, if it is, is in the deep waters of the Gulf. There is not a lot of easily accessible cheap oil left onshore in Mexico or in shallow waters. And Pemex does not know or does not have the money or the technology 
to explore in the deep waters of the Gulf. These are very expensive explorations that uh, require, you know, sometimes you're, you're ending, you're paying two, three hundred thousand dollars a day for rigs to poke holes in the seabed at the seven or eight thousand feet deep. And many times you don't find any stuff. The companies that the foreign companies that have been exploring on the Mexican side of the waters since 2014, Exxon, Shell, BP have not found anything so far. Everyone thinks it's there and it probably is there, but they haven't found anything. And so Pemex just simply doesn't have the capability of doing that. And the oil that is available on land, on shore, or in shallow waters is uh, there are small deposits with small uh, amounts, each one, which are impractical, low yields, etc. And in the north, where there may be a lot of shale oil, especially along the Texan border, where on the American side, there's a lot of shale oil. The current Mexican government is opposed to fracking. And so it is not exploring for oil on land in Coahuila, mainly and partly in Chihuahua, but mainly in Coahuila, which is on the Mexican side of uh, where the United States has found an enormous amount of shale oil along the border with Mexico. So pivoting back to foreign policy for a bit, Whilst I see analysts painting Mexico as a nation that just follows U.S. foreign policy no matter what, I would also note that they don't follow the U.S. into international engagements very often. For example, they didn't declare war in Afghanistan in 2001 like many U.S. allies did. They are getting too involved in Ukraine like many U.S. allies have. And unlike Canada, they never join NATO. So if there is this massive interconnectedness between Mexico and the United States, why wouldn't Mexico join an organization like NATO? Well, joining NATO has really never been an issue because uh, we're not in the North Atlantic and because we wouldn't be able to really contribute much to NATO. And the, the notion of Mexico joining any military alliance, given its traditional sort of independent foreign policy, would not sit well in Mexico. The more complicated challenge is that after, since NAFTA 1994 and trade opening, privatization and liberalization and democratization, etc. One might have thought that Mexico could become a country with an attitude towards world issues more similar to other countries with similar institutional setups. In other words, that it would join sort of like-minded countries on all of these conflicts, on all of these issues, including uh, climate change, terrorism, corruption, etc., that it would be, it would have a foreign policy, if not more in tune with the United States, at least more in tune with countries like Canada, like Sweden, like France, like Spain, and not so much be aligned with countries like Cuba or the third world countries in the United Nations or the non-aligned movement or what's left of it, etc. And that has not been the case. There were moments when this was the case during the, the Iraq war in 2003. But this government in particular, and the previous one up to a certain extent also, feel more comfortable with this sort of third worldish, non-aligned, uh, neutralist, not being too cozy with the rich countries. They're not comfortable with the notion that Mexico belongs to the sort of group of poor, rich countries, let's put it that way. That if it's a member of the OECD, it's just because of its economic situation, but that should not affect its foreign policy, its view of the world, the countries it's friendly with, etc. The one war that Mexico City and Washington do work together on, though, is the US war on drugs, which at the moment still largely takes place inside Mexico. Can you take us through how this issue shapes the relationship between Mexico and the U.S.? The current war on drugs began in 2000, late 2006 under President Calderon when he sent the army into fighting drugs and, uh, and crime and delinquency. So it's lasted now almost 17, 16, 17 years, uh, three Mexican administrations, and it has been, of course, a total failure. 
If at the beginning of the war on drugs, it was a cocaine issue of cocaine being transshipped through Mexico to the United, from South America to the United States, it then went through a heroin phase, and now it's a fentanyl phase. But essentially, the amount of drugs and the conflictive nature of the relationship with the United States over drugs is the same today or even worse than it was 17 years ago. Secondly, the violence and crime and mortality in Mexico as a result of the war on drugs is worse today than it was before the war began. Mexico is a much more violent country today than it was in 2006 when the war on drugs began. At the time, we had something like eight homicides per 100,000, willful homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. Today, we have around 25 or 26, uh, three times more. And the same is true for extortion, kidnapping, et cetera, et cetera. So from any perspective, the war on drugs since 2007 has been a complete failure. AMLO's policy is rhetorically and symbolically different but in fact, it doesn't seem to be that different at all. You continue to see pictures, for example, you can see often in the Mexican newspapers of army contingents burning marijuana fields in the mountains, which is about the most useless activity that an army can do in life. To begin with, because it Marijuana is kind of legal in Mexico. You know, Mexico is a strange place where normal notions of legality are not very clear. But the Supreme Court did rule recently, the last two or three years ago, that there was a significant level of legality in marijuana production and consumption. More than half American states have legalized marijuana. So why in the world do you send the army up into the mountains to burn marijuana fields? It's ridiculous. But that's what AMLO has continued to do. There continue to be checkpoints on the highways, and there continue to be raids and continue to be shootouts between the army and the drug cartels. So his policy is rhetorically what he calls hugs, not bullets, abrazos, no balazos. But in fact, his policy is not that different from presidents Peña Nieto and Calderón before him. And in any case, the effects of his policies are pretty much the same in the sense that the violence is the same, the criminality is the same, and the volume of exports of drugs from Mexico to the United States is the same, if not much greater. The difference, perhaps, is that the Americans are not very happy with this, whereas the Americans tended to be happy uh, with Calderón and with Peña Nieto in particular of the DEA, has been shut out of the U.S.-Mexican cooperation. And information sharing and intelligence sharing and speed of extraditions all have uh, diminished because the uh, López Obrador administration does not want to deal with the DEA ever since the former Secretary of Defense was arrested in the United States, although he was eventually sent back to, he was freed and sent back to Mexico. That got the Mexican army terribly upset, and Lopez Colorado is greatly, tremendously in bed with the Mexican army, and so he uh, cut off all cooperation with the DEA. So that's one element of why they're not happy. The other element is that unlike previous drug crises in the United States, except for the 1980s uh, and the crack epidemic at the time, the number of all opioid-related overdoses in the United States has skyrocketed the past few years, more than 100,000 in the last fiscal year. And a large majority of those opioid-related overdoses come from fentanyl, and a large majority of the fentanyl consumed or entering the United States comes from or through Mexico. This is up for discussion, whether it's from China through Mexico or from Mexico. And that has become a domestic political problem in the United States for the Biden administration. And it feels that Lopez Obrador is not doing anything about it. And it has a point 
just a few days ago, the Mexican president declared that Mexico does not produce fentanyl, which the United States rapidly responded to by saying, yes, it does. And even the Mexican army has announced in recent times that, for example, it closed down a fentanyl lab in Sinaloa, which where they confiscated millions of fentanyl pills. So it's kind of difficult to understand how all that stuff can be there if Mexico doesn't produce fentanyl. And so the Americans are not happy with this situation and they're, they are pressuring enormously, particularly in recent times, for Lopez Obrador to crack down on either fentanyl producing labs or transit routes to the United States or precursor chemical imports into Mexico from China to make fentanyl in Mexico or all of the above. And Lopez Obrador is not terribly excited about doing all of that because he's got the army doing everything else. And the Mexican army uh, is incredibly ill-prepared to do any one thing in particular, let alone to do 10 things at the same time. It is now in charge of building airports and managing them, setting up a new airline, building a train in Yucatan, building and running banks and bank um, branch offices all over the country. It's in charge of the customs and operations in Mexican ports and Mexican airports. It's in charge of distributing medicines and vaccines. And they can't do that and pursue Central American migrants, which is the main job Lopez Obrador has it doing, and fight drugs. It's just simply incapable of doing all that stuff at the same time. The war on drugs has by all accounts been a dismal failure. Billions of dollars and thousands of lives have been spent in the pursuit of stopping drugs from entering the United States, and yet overdoses are increasing at an alarming rate. And even if the United States or the DEA can have a win every now and again, the game itself just adapts and changes. As an example, with the US adapting technology and becoming better at border control, cartels simply adapted. And now products like fentanyl, a drug much more potent and easier to transport than heroin, are now coming across the border in huge amounts. And this adaptation has made things even more difficult for the United States, as unlike the massive drug labs you envision from shows like Breaking Bad, or the massive of cocoa or heroin fields you envision from other drug shows, fentanyl can be cooked up by just two guys in a room the size of a two-car garage, using a handful of chemicals imported from overseas, which means no more spotting coca and marijuana fields from above with planes or satellites, no more ability for the United States to track large quantities of chemicals being shipped to a warehouse, and far less people to switch and become informants, as there's only two people cooking the drugs. The US and Mexican governments no longer have to find a needle in a haystack, but instead find thousands of microscopic needles in an even bigger haystack. So how does the US plan on tackling this issue? How have the cartels adapted their approach now that fentanyl, methamphetamine, and other synthetic drugs dominate the market? And what incentives does the Mexican government have to get involved when much of that money re-enters the Mexican economy through the grey and black markets? What we'll answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Selling Suffering El Chapo has been one of the most innovative drug traffickers. Uh, really, he is in the pantheon of the most notorious top traffickers along with Pablo Escobar and um, I would say the most successful drug trafficker ever, Du Yusheng, who was a Chinese drug trafficker in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, and at the same time, Chiang Kai-shek's Minister of Counter-Narcotics. Nonetheless, uh, even those really innovative, uh, brutal, ruthless uh, drug traffickers, there's really not been any case when simply removing the top leader has undone the trafficking networks far more so in the drug trade and a lot of organized crime broadly beyond the drug trade, the top leaders are replaceable. In general, in drug trafficking and organized crime, replacing the top leaders is far easier than replacing the top leaders in terrorist groups. You think about the impact of decapitating something like the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path in the 
1980s and 1990s, capturing Guzman, the leader of the Shining Path, or killing bin Laden uh, and pushing the top uh, Al-Qaeda leadership into hiding, killing Zawahiri. Uh, Those have been far more impactful events on the enterprise of the terrorist group and terrorism than capturing and killing the drug traffickers. Vanda Falba Brown is a senior fellow at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institute. She's also the director for the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and the co-director of the Africa Security Initiative and the Brookings series on opioids. Previously, she was also the co-director of the Brookings Project Improving Global Drug Policy, as well as the Reconstituting Local Orders Program. Falba Brown is an expert on international and internal conflicts and non-traditional security threats, including insurgencies, organized crime, urban violence, illicit economies, and her fieldwork and research have covered, among others, Afghanistan, South Asia, Burma, Indonesia, Morocco, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, and most importantly for today, Mexico. In addition to this, she's also written a wide number of books and papers focusing on the illicit trade and black markets around the world, with a particular focus on drugs, and we're thrilled to have her on the program today. For drugs and other illegal contraband, there is demand. So different entities will step into the vacuum created even if a drug trafficking network is dismantled. And just taking the top leader really doesn't dismantle the network. It requires far more comprehensive interdiction of the middle layer underneath. So in short, in the drug trade on organized crimes, leaders are easy to replace even when they are very competent and leaders. The following leadership might not so be competent, but the trade and the group will flood on and existing demand will drive new actors to continue delivering the contraband product. One of the trends we're particularly seeing in Mexico today is the decentralization of much of the cartel's operations, where the drug trade seems to be morphing from a centralized, tight-knit cartel structure to one that almost uses a gig economy where middle management will simply hire a few guys to make a batch of fentanyl and then give it to another couple of people they've just hired to get it across the border, in much the same way I hail an Uber or get a delivery of food. Can you dig us through why the cartels are moving in this direction and what this trend means to the drug trade? So the effect of so-called high-value targeting, which is the decapitation strategy in Mexico, has led to the splintering of the groups. Uh, And if this splintering has been taking place across several decades, so if you look uh, until sort of the late 70s and early 80s, you have one big cartel, that's the Guadalajara cartel, that is intimately connected to Mexican law enforcement uh, officials and the very top of uh, the Mexican leadership. There is deep corruption and infiltration. And after the cartel, with the help of Mexican officials, captures and brutally tortures and murders U.S. drug enforcement agent Enrique Kiki Camarena, there is significant pressure from the U.S. to go after the cartel. And eventually the Mexican government, despite their complicity to avoid the U.S. wrath, yields to that pressure and there are arrests of the top Guadalajara leaders. That then generates the first splintering of the Guadalajara cartel to about three, four groups, one of which is the Sinaloa cartel, that is the Tijuana cartel, Juarez cartel, and the Gulf cartel. The Gulf cartel is a separate entity from the Guadalajara cartel, but has been emerging as the Guadalajara cartel is weakening. Subsequent rounds of interdiction 20 years later leads to more splintering and more splintering within the Sinaloa cartel. Some of it is driven by internal dynamics within the criminal market, the choices that the criminal groups themselves make. For example, the split of the Zetas uh, from the Gulf cartel, the enforcers of the, of the Gulf cartel split from the Gulf cartel. And a lot of that splintering is driven by the decapitation high value targeting policy. So, you know, we go from one big cartel in the 1980s to four, five in the 1990s to maybe 12, six, seven large ones in the first parts of the 2000 decades. And now today we are in a state of very many groups, but nonetheless, within this very complex environment in which many of the criminal groups are uh, no longer really capable of trafficking drugs wholesale, there are two large cartels. There's the Sinaloa cartel and cartel Jalisca Nova Generacion. And they are in a bipolar war 
with themselves in Mexico. But this war has also filled out of Mexico and really is raging from Mexico south all the way down to Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Costa Rica and blowing up criminal markets that had already been violent, like Colombia pushing the violence further and making it more complicated, but also affecting and driving significantly violence up even in criminal markets or places where the criminal markets seem not to be very violent, such as Chile and Costa Rica. Across Latin America, law enforcement forces, policing forces are very weak, and they really have very limited incapacitation capability so the ability to identify, arrest key perpetrators, and that's linked to very poor investigation capacity, and they overall deeply lack deterrence capacity. In striking contrast to police forces in the United States, in Europe, and in East Asia. When we think about drug smuggling into the US, we often envision men crossing the border with backpacks full of drugs or a car full of packages. But in all honesty, the vast majority of drugs, particularly into the European, Asian and Australian markets, come in via ports or the mail. Drug dealers know that if they send 100 sea containers full of drugs or 100 packages through the mail, less than 1% of them will actually be intercepted and confiscated by quarantine authorities. As these ports are regularly understaffed and only function because of how fast, they can get the containers off the ship, onto the trucks and trains, and out of the port, leaving very little time to do inspections. And if these ports did choose to slow down the operation and carry out these inspections, many of their customers would simply go to another port. So with millions of containers coming in every day, and only a few inspectors with even less time to search them, cartels can often get their drugs through here quite securely. But even though globalization in these ports have proven incredibly successful for the drug cartels, they still use multiple routes to get their drugs from their manufacturing origin to their market buyers. Some use routes up through Africa, some use routes directly to Europe, some use submarines and some use planes, others still use mules and people carrying backpacks full of drugs. But what I want to know is if they have this port method which is so successful and so solid, why use all these other methods to also transport drugs? There are two reasons why there are many methods. One is that it's a cat and mouse game with law enforcement. So a smart drug trafficking organization will want to have as diversified methods as possible because at some point a particular method, uh, even something like semi-submersibles and more developed full submarines, uh, will be detected. The second answer is that drugs like cocaine cannot be produced in Europe. They are not grown in Europe. Methamphetamine and synthetic drugs can be produced there, and that's why we are seeing the growth of meth production in what used to be ecstasy labs. So uh, how far you need to uh, transport uh, any kind of drug is a function of what kind of drug it is that you are trying to deliver. Beyond that, the most frequent system of delivery is hiding drugs in legal cargo or hiding precursor chemicals in legal cargo. But that's simply one method, and the range of semi-submersibles and sub submersibles is extending. A fast boat uh, cannot go across the Atlantic, uh, but a small plane can. And so we are seeing planes flying from Venezuela, from Brazil, uh, landing in various parts of West Africa, where the drugs travel through different routes. Some are loaded onto ships that go to European ports. Others are carried by land and arrive in places like Libya and Morocco and then cross the water. Uh, drugs that are coming from Afghanistan, heroin, there is still very large market for heroin in Europe that hasn't dropped out, go uh, often by land across Central Asia. The war in Ukraine has disrupted some of the heroin smuggling route from Russia and through Ukraine onto Europe. So we're seeing shifts there as this has become a very difficult environment to cross. Many drugs still go through Turkey. One of the reasons why uh, Turkish drug trafficking networks have become so powerful and expanded um, across various European markets. The second being that the drug trafficking networks some uh, often uh, try to recruit from uh, the Turkish diaspora. With so many of these countries now getting involved in this trade, how is it changing the US foreign policy towards some of these new players? Oh, I'm glad that we can talk about the foreign policy and geopolitics of the drug market. So as long as the US market was principally focused on cocaine, which is really from the 
80s through the early 2000s, the countries with which the United States had to deal with were countries in Latin America in the Andean region. It was also the places of transshipment, which would be Caribbean countries, Central American countries, and uh, Mexico. But the switch to fentanyl thrust to the forefront of the countries that the United States needs to deal with, China and India. Uh, China is the principal uh, supplier of precursor chemicals uh, for fentanyl today, and until about 2019, it was also the principal supplier of finished fentanyl. For a while, there was a limited period uh, of China's cooperation uh, with the United States in trying to crack down on the fentanyl supply, and that's why China changed, became the supplier of Precursor chemicals for fentanyl and finished fentanyl would be cooked in Mexico by the Mexican cartels, the big large sponsors, Sinaloa and Cartel Jalisco Nova Generacion, which would then bring it across the border to the United States. As the geopolitical relationship between China and Russia has become steadily worsened and China did not get the expected lessening of rivalry and competition from the Biden administration, or the Trump administration that it had expected as a payment in China's view for its cooperation on cracking down on the illegal supply of fentanyl to the United States. China withdrew from that cooperation, really that has tanked and become almost nothing. And so today there are signs again that the Mexican cartels are bringing to Mexico not just precursors for fentanyl, although that's still happening, but that there is a rise again in fentanyl supply. India is the second largest supplier of precursor chemicals as well as very many synthetic drugs. The supply of precursors for fentanyl from India to the United States are limited so far, but it's a country that could easily replace China if China started cooperating more, which is not imminent. But India is already a big supplier of precursor chemicals for methamphetamine that's produced in East Asia. So China is now the principal rival competitor for the United States, and India is the country that the United States has been courting, trying to build up as a strategic partner against uh, China in the Asia-Pacific region. So all of a sudden, drugs intersect not with countries that are not significant actors in the geopolitical competition, but with the most important countries in the geopolitical competition, China and India. And both the large strategic competitor, China and India, struggle in meaningful cooperation with the United States. Uh, India's regulation of its drug pharmaceutical chemical industry is even poorer uh, than that of China. The pharma chemical industry in India is also very politically powerful uh, in India, just as it is in in China, but is even less regulated. And for a long time, until really the last five years, India was essentially in full denial that its pharmaceutical industry was producing massive amount of synthetic drugs and precursor chemicals, or that it was supplying superpotent tramadol to Africa, where the drug was causing a vast amount of damage. Since India-US cooperation more broadly has become more multifaceted and has intensified, we have seen more of an India's effort and more of cooperation with the United States to try to bring uh, more regulation, more oversight, beef up law enforcement measures in uh, dealing with the chemical pharmaceutical industry. But the baseline is low, and lots of this dealing with the strategic partner whom the United States wants to cultivate as the strategic partner are starting from a low baseline. China has really withdrawn completely from any cooperation in the summer of 2022, but that cooperation uh, was really slowing down and weakening even prior to that, um, since the beginning of the uh, Biden administration. As I mentioned, the, China has assumed that for extending cooperation on cracking down on fentanyl and precursor supply, it would be rewarded uh, by the United States with an easing of the geopolitical competition. The U.S. government, both in the Trump administration and, and uh, crucially in the Biden administration, 
on the other hand, envisioned that they would separate the narcotics issue as well as other issues such as climate or wildlife trafficking from the geopolitical competition. Whilst the US can't focus too much on China or India, they are focusing most of their attention with the drug issue on Mexico. And when it comes to Mexico, they seem to be prioritizing a brute force strategy. But are these strategies actually working or are they just proving ineffective? So not all countries are using their militaries to go after drug traffickers. That has been specific to uh, places like Colombia and Mexico. To some extent, that was taking place in Afghanistan when NATO was in the country before uh, the Taliban took over. Simply high-value targeting in the counter-narcotics space comes from many problems, including the splintering uh, that we talked about, and this particularly pronounced in countries that have law enforcement forces with such weak law enforcement capacity and deterrence capacity and where the state is really not uh, effectively in charge of large territories. This problem has been even far more intense in Mexico than in Colombia, because when the United States with the Colombian government went after the Medellin cartel, there was only one other cartel, uh, but there was only one other large cartel, and that was uh, the Cali cartel. And the Cali cartel joined the fight against Medellin, and eventually after the Medellin cartel was dismantled and weakened, the United States put pressure on the Colombian government to go after the Cali cartel. But then there was more or less the same bipolar structure in Colombia in the 80s that's in Mexico today, minus this myriad of uh, smaller groups. There were smaller criminal groups, but they were not as out of control in Colombia uh, as they are in Mexico today. But of course, the, the downside or consequence of the cartel targeting in Colombia was that it allowed the right-wing paramilitary forces, the Auto Defensas de Colombia, as well as the leftist guerrillas like the FARC and ELN to insert themselves into the drug trade in ways they were not able to do when the two large cartels were in existence. In Mexico, the targeting has led to the splintering and produced the criminal market that's out of control out of control of Mexican government, but also out of control of the criminal groups. The problem today, however, is not wrong target. There is a way to do targeting much better. I have long advocated going after the middle layer of the trafficking group and try to arrest as much of the, of the middle layer at once. This is the way we do drug policy targeting uh, in the United States. This is the way Europe uh, does uh, law enforcement targeting. It doesn't end criminality, doesn't end drug trafficking, but it creates lesser negative side effects or can even avoid the negative side effects. And it puts more, much, much stronger thrust, it debilitates a criminal group in a much stronger way. But in Mexico today, the problem is not that it's high level targeting or middle level targeting or any other targeting. There is simply no targeting. The administration of uh, President Andres Manuel López Obrador has given up, uh, has not mounted any security law enforcement strategy and is essentially pulled back from any kind of confrontation with the criminal groups, hoping that if he just lets them be, they will sort the problems out among themselves. That has not happened. Instead, the power, brazenness, aggressiveness, of the Mexican criminal groups has simply grown. Vast amounts of fentanyl are flowing to the United States and Mexican crime groups, particularly the large cartels, Sinaloa and Cartel Jalisco Nova Generacion, are controlling wider territories, larger numbers of people and larger and larger parts of the Mexican economy. Not just the illegal economy like drugs, but legal economies, mining, logging, agriculture, um, fishing. And they're even controlling institutions, playing far greater role, for example, in elections. Not just coercing whoever is a winner in a particular municipality, uh, but determining who can run in the first place. So high value targeting is problematic, but it is even worse to just give up on policing and law enforcement. So this issue obviously goes deeper than just people making drugs in their warehouse and then selling it for money. Throughout the industry, there has been a significant move of recent years towards synthetic drugs, 
and a continuing divergence where the US market chases downers like fentanyl, whilst the European and Asian markets chase uppers like meth, cocaine, or yaba. But what are the underlying causes here? What's driving this new shift in the market, and where will all this end up? Well, to answer that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Disregarding Demand So if we get into the weeds a little bit and bring up the classic cartels that I think are now rather infamous, the Sinaloa cartel and the cartel Jalisco New Generation, we have to look in specific regions and in specific economies. Because in some cases, I do believe that the term cartel referring to a grouping of businesses or organizations that basically works to price fix or kind of provide a barrier to competition. I think that applies to several of the economies that these groups have their tentacles in, but not all. When we talk about these organizations as cartels, we're usually referring to them in the drug trade. That's been mostly in the cocaine trade on its way to the United States and increasingly to Europe. But now, obviously, we're looking at synthetic opioids, fentanyl being the biggest one as it drives deaths in the United States to staggering degrees. Do these organizations have a cartel-like control or even structure over those drug trafficking economies? I would say no. That would imply that they are controlling the production at the earliest stage. So in the case of cocaine, that means you run the coca fields, the farmers uh, sell directly to you, you run the logistics all the way up through Central America into Mexico and then on into the United States or across South America to Europe. And then you run the actual distribution, which is where you can kind of get your price setting benefits. I don't see that as the case. I think there's a lot more specialization in the world of drug trafficking today. So you have organizations that maybe are dealing with only moving supply of, say, cocaine from point A to point B, and that's their entire contribution. Scott Missler Ferguson is a notable investigative researcher working for various organizations focused on organized crime and trafficking, with a particular focus on Latin America. Scott has written several grain analysis pieces on organized crime in Mexico and on his recent inroads into the drug markets of Asia, Africa, and Europe. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. When we get to these larger organizations like the Jalisco cartel, known as the CJNG, or the Sinaloa cartel, yes, they still form kind of an outsized part of this market, but are they controlling in a monopolistic level to the standard where they can set the price that they want in the United States when they're selling in Europe or as they move increasingly to the Asia Pacific? No, I do not think that they warrant the title cartel. You have dozens of organizations that do not form this classic pyramid structure that I think a lot of U.S. policymakers and pundits kind of have in their mind when they're describing these cartels. A few years ago, Brazil tried to tackle their drug problem by bringing in heavy weaponry, armored vehicles, tanks, and whatnot, and storming the favelas in force, particularly in the areas where their new crime would be rampant. And for more details on that particular issue, we have an entire episode you can check out. But this brute force tactic, why don't we see it rolled out as much here in Mexico? So to be fair, that is a strategy that has been employed in Mexico to varying degrees, not quite with the kind of consistency that you see in the favelas in Rio that you're referring to. But under former President Felipe Calderón, this was an important piece of his strategy, as he put it, not necessarily to battle the cartel but simply to fight for citizen security. This is the language that he would frequently place this in. But the result is you did get a very high level of militarization of this strategy of fighting the cartels. And as such, you get the militarization of large sects of Mexican society. And that has not changed under the current president, Andres Manuel López Obrador. That is obviously changing in terms of his narrative, 
This is a president who's very comfortable controlling the narrative. As you may know, he will give his daily kind of morning briefings where he really is effective at kind of setting the tone for the media for that day. And so he has done a very good job of recasting his fight against organized crime in Mexico while still deploying higher numbers of troops, finally formalizing the addition of his National Guard into the Ministry of Defense, which had already been somewhat of a uh, de facto truth on the ground. But now that's an institutionalized truth where the National Guard is no longer a civilian force even in name and is firmly held under the defense ministry. Now, all this is to say that the militarization and the kind of sending the tanks in and using the classic destroy uh, your enemy tactic has been used. And to put it simply, it does not work because you are employing a kind of military strategy against an organization that does not operate in the same way that, say, an opposing army might operate. So the best example of this is, of course, the infamous kingpin strategy. The kingpin strategy, in essence, uses the targeting of the top operatives of a criminal organization. Uh, so whoever the leadership may be, uh, that can come in the form of arresting, killing, or attempting to scare them out of the country. But in essence, it follows the logic that you see in more traditional warfare of if you cut the head off the snake, the rest of the organism will cease to exist and you will eradicate the problem. Now, anyone who has looked at Mexico in the last decade will be perfectly aware that that is not what happens when you cut the head off the snake. What actually happens is you get a kind of hydra effect where the organization will simply splinter into a whole swarm of smaller and potentially less powerful organizations. So you can point to that as a minor success on paper. But in actuality, when you have these smaller organizations that now are more fragile in their territorial control, in their grip on, say, political protection, wherever they may operate, and their grip on the communities where they operate, they're going to likely turn to violence, to reassert dominance, and groups outside of that zone may see it as an opportunity to muscle in guns blazing and take over some of that space that's now seen as open because the head of one organization was replaced. To give the removal of El Chapo Guzman, the former leader of the Sinaloa cartel, basically uh, split into multiple factions. The organization was already quite federated, so it's not very hard to see how this kind of splintering would be catalyzed even further. Weakening one organization does not mean you are affecting the overall flow of drugs or that illicit economy that you are trying to prevent. So why are we seeing this industry-wide move towards synthetic drugs, particularly fentanyl and methamphetamine? Is it just because it's cheaper and easier to move, or are there other forces behind it? This is a very important question because it gets into the geopolitics of the relationship, not just with the United States and Mexico, but with China. China has long been the primary supplier of fentanyl and also precursor chemicals used to produce fentanyl to the United States. And to be fair, through courier packages and kind of more low-level trafficking, China does still send some fentanyl and precursor chemicals directly to the United States. And when I say China, of course, we're referring to chemical producer companies or in many cases, kind of intermediary companies that will buy in the form of kind of a straw buyer uh, with a clean record directly from these chemical producers and deliver to the United States. So the idea that all of the fentanyl or all of the synthetic opioids flooding into the United States comes strictly from Mexico is vastly oversimplifying the issue. 
the majority of fentanyl in the United States is coming from Mexico in terms of raw volume. But when we account for purity, which is vastly different uh, depending on whether it comes from Mexico or China, then it's not quite as big a gap as I think it's portrayed as in popular media. Fentanyl coming from China is typically far more pure than what we see seized along the border with Mexico. Now, production in Mexico is very high, but again, this gets into kind of the differences in how this is portrayed in Mexico and how it's portrayed in the United States. In the United States, the classic refrain is that these massive drug laboratories are used to produce fentanyl pills by the thousands that are then shipped in to the United States to destroy communities, when in reality, some of these laboratories, in fact, the majority of these laboratories that are seized and destroyed in states like um, Sinaloa, for example, are really modest, small, kind of mom and pop shop style uh, production facilities that may not even be manufacturing the drug itself, they might just be, for example, a pill press laboratory that takes the chemicals and produces a final product then to be sell sold on in the United States. So is Mexico producing, or in this case, supplying the United States with the majority of its fentanyl? Yes. But is it the high level sophisticated operation that it's portrayed as? Not always. It is moving on that path. And I think that is what has a lot of lawmakers in the United States particularly concerned. So why are we seeing this massive shift within the industry from our historical plant-based drugs like cocaine toward its synthetic drugs like fentanyl? Is it a lower barrier of entry? Is it logistics? Or is it just pure economics that's pushing this trend? As you well know, these organizations are not very interested in specializing in one illicit economy. They will wrap their hands around as many possible illicit economies as possible, get involved in oil theft, illegal logging, illegal fishing, um, really just a panoply of illicit markets. The real driver behind this change from cocaine to fentanyl is just a matter of simple economics. Crop-based drugs like cocaine require a lot of land. They're labor-intensive. They require a great deal of territorial control. So if I'm trying to source cocaine from, say, eastern Colombia, that requires that I have contacts with a criminal organization in Colombia that sources cocaine from laboratories that have been sourcing coca in bulk, which requires criminal organizations to have a high degree of territorial control over a specific region. And that's leaving out the fact that I then have to transport the final product from South America all the way through Central America or perhaps the Pacific or the Caribbean, uh, depending on which route I have my connections in. And then I still have to make that final logistical push to bring that cocaine to the United States, where I'm going to make my markup in profits. On the other hand, if I choose narcotics like synthetic opioids, specifically fentanyl, I don't need that land intensive control. I need a small laboratory where I can receive chemical precursors from China or increasingly India as well, where I can press those into pills and send them along. So from a supply side standpoint, these drugs are cheaper to produce. They don't require the type of criminal dominance that you would see in traditional drugs like cocaine. And when we get into the resale of these drugs, they are vastly more addictive. Fentanyl is extremely addictive uh, compared to traditional drugs like heroin or cocaine, far more potent than um, heroin. I believe it's 100 times more potent than morphine. So what you can then do is splice, say, one individual uh, pill of fentanyl, and you're going to get a lot more value out of it because of its extreme potency 
and because of its addictive qualities, you're probably going to get a lot more return customers. So simple economics behind it are driving this far more than a desire to, say, inundate the United States with a dangerous chemical substance as it's often portrayed in the media. If it has got this much easier and it is just purely economics driving this trend, why do we still see the trade of the more expensive to produce drugs thriving throughout the world? And why are so many cartels using the more difficult routes through Africa into Europe or building tunnels underneath the US border? Surely if it just comes down to economics, they would just all do fentanyl all the time. Diversification is incredibly important to criminal organizations, especially drug traffickers, as the product they're moving is sought after for seizures by law enforcement in practically any country in any jurisdiction around the world. So in order to protect profits, you need to make sure that you are diluting risk as much as possible. Would shipping all of your, say, cocaine or heroin or fentanyl through shipping containers and into large-scale ports be more effective? Absolutely. You can ship far higher quantities than you can through shipping containers than you can, say, by using land vehicles or even the classic narco planes, which are carrying really minimal quantities when compared with the kind of bulk trade that you can engage with if you use maritime ports. However, if you put all your eggs in that basket and seizures get a little better, or perhaps a port starts to increase its scanning capacities, you're running some serious risks in your business. So in the case of cocaine trafficking, for example, it's not always simple market economics that dictate where an organization sends its cocaine through. As you well know, geographically speaking, sending cocaine that, say, comes from Peru straight to Brazil would be much faster to get it across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe than first stopping in Paraguay. But if I'm a trafficking organization based in Brazil, maybe I have better contacts along the border with Paraguay, or perhaps I know that I'm much less likely to have my shipments scanned or looked at if they move first through, say, a Paraguayan border or the airport. So this is where you're going to see traffickers make the decision to use a wider variety of not just routes, but also modes of transportation, knowing that it's not the fastest way, it's not the most business sensible, but it is in the long term the best way to mitigate those risks of seizures. The US war on drugs started in the 60s under Richard Nixon, but really ramped up during the Bush Jr. administration. And since that step up in 06, where drugs were going to be fought in the same way we fight terrorism, has the situation on the ground gotten better or worse, and are more or less drugs making it to the US markets? To be quite blunt, this war is definitely getting worse. We have a lot of metrics to back that statement up, but I think the most classic would be through perceptions of citizen security. And if you look at homicide rates, if you look at the rates of forced displaced people in Mexico, if you look at the rate of, say, femicides in Mexico, where women or girls are targeted for killings specifically on account of their gender, which is well established to be linked often to organized crime. All these metrics point to increases in the last few years. Now, to be fair, this is not a nationwide issue. You have plenty of states in Mexico that are completely safe, have flourishing tourism industries, have relatively high citizen security, and there is no problem of high levels of homicides. That does not mean that there's no presence of organized crime. That means that for whatever reason, perhaps one organization is dominant in that area, or perhaps you have tacit agreements between multiple organizations you have a degree of calm basically placed over an entire region. While at the same time, if you look at states like Zacatecas, Jalisco, Michoacan, 
you have anything but citizen security. You have long-standing cartel conflicts between large groups that gets back to this kind of fragmentation in the criminal landscape uh, that we've discussed in Mexico that really is at the heart of long-standing violence in these states where one organization is unable to form hegemonic control and therefore you get these never-ending cycles of violence. We've tried violence, we've tried coercion, we've tried securing the border, we've tried fighting this issue like a war, and still the US has had no success in denting the flow of drugs coming into the country. So if we tried all those solutions, what about the ones we haven't tried yet? How likely are they to work? Well, to answer that, we do it to our final guest. Part 4. Singing the Wrong Song In certain spaces, of course, um, organized crime carries a ton of currency, and a lot of it is a class question. The idea of being able to move up social and economic classes in a way that is it is more rapid than others, this is something that people obviously aspire to. And it's not just Mexico and it's not just organized crime, but of course, these guys can build legends around thumbing their nose at the elites. In some respects, uh, certainly influential in a political way because they can finance campaigns and uh, in particular on the local level can certainly influence probably the cases we've most seen over the years have to do with governors, but there are accusations that it reaches all the way to the top. And certainly we have instances of that in the security forces, one of whom was a you know top level policeman who was just convicted recently in the United States for drug trafficking. Stephen Dudley is the co-founder and co-director of Inside Crime, a research and analysis organization focused on organized crime and corruption in Latin America and the Caribbean. Stephen is also a senior research fellow at the American University Center for Latin American and Latino Studies in Washington, D.C., and has published works including MS-13, The Making of America's Most Notorious Gang. Stephen is also the former bureau chief for the Miami Herald in the Andean region and has reported from Haiti, Brazil, Nicaragua, Cuba, and many others. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. I've never been a fan of the word cartel. These are multi-layered, complex organizations that have all kinds of extended networks and are not controlling prices, as you would imagine a classic cartel. The reality of these organizations, even ones that we talk about in monolithic terms, like the Sinaloa cartel, is that they are various branches So if we're going to be specific about this, then we're going to talk about wholesale buyers of large amounts of drugs on the local or perhaps international level, and then specialists in transports and smuggling and getting things across borders that are not allowed to cross those borders. That's their value add. Once they get across the borders, then they are selling these items wholesale and getting out. You know, what we see from analyzing closely court cases in the United States is that there is a grand distance between those who are distributing these drugs in the United States and these large quote unquote cartels that are, you know, furnishing the United States with quite a bit of drugs. So these are layers upon layers. And that's why it's so difficult to defeat them because it doesn't matter if you take out one part of this distribution chain. It is so easy to replace at this stage that it's just part of the way business is done. It it very much set up the way global businesses are established. So this is what makes it so difficult is that they are not cartels. So we're starting to see a trend where fentanyl is coming out of China and India and into Mexico and Mexico then packages it up for sale and distribution. And many of the actors here in Mexico have looked at this part of the process in the same way a standard business selling candy or standard pharmaceuticals would, and have innovated parts of the process like making the product into pharmaceutical style pills, knowing that the middle class mums of the US were pretty unlikely to use a needle, or pre-packaging the pills into amounts that make it easier for mid-level distributors to break apart and dole out to their street sellers. 
or even make sure they dilute it right down from the concentrated amounts coming out of India and China to an amount far less likely to kill the customer base. So why has Mexico chosen to take on this almost middleman value-added part of the supply chain? You have criminal organizations that, or even middlemen, really, brokers, that are obtaining the precursors that they need, moving them to maybe chemists, but, but more often probably cooks, rudimentary cooks, that are taking these precursors and then moving them into fentanyl. So, you know, we're talking about a pretty underground operation in terms of the final step of moving it from precursor to fentanyl. Um, that's one way that they will get their fentanyl. And, and then, of course, you're taking that fentanyl and you're diluting it many, many times because you don't want to kill your, your, your customer base. And also you want to spread out your profits. And then you're, and then you're lacing it into these counterfeit pills. What we're seeing is that the quality is quite low, but starting to see a slight rise in quality. And we know this from seizures that are being made, although you're seeing a great variation of quality and, and purity of the drugs that are, that are passing, which gives us an indication that they're still doing, many are still doing this rudimentary process, but there's also many people who are trying to do this process. This isn't sort of concentrated in any one single hands, which is different from the fentanyl the very controlled circumstances under which fentanyl is being produced in a place like India. So those are two different uh, production areas that we're talking about with two different sort of quality control spaces. There is no quality control in many respects. The fentanyl that's being produced in these very rudimentary spaces sometimes in Mexico, which is why you're having these batches of counterfeit drugs or, you know, legacy drugs that are laced with fentanyl and that are causing these outbreaks of, of overdoses. The patterns of overdoses that you see in the United States come from batches. A single dealer sells a batch of legacy drugs that are laced with fentanyl and that batch has too much fentanyl laced inside. And that leads to the overdoses. That is because you're not, you don't have this sort of quality control. So we know a lot about who these players are, and we arrest people up and down the supply chains all the time. And yet, we still can't prevent this from happening. I do understand why catching terrorist groups is really hard to do through money laundering, as frankly, the budgets that terrorist groups are usually working with are very small. But drugs, well, drugs is a huge financial industry. So why can't we track the funds here and catch these criminals through at least money laundering? Well, we can. We just don't. It's just a, it's just a decision. There's just the resources are not put in that direction. It's not like this is just a Mexico problem either. In the United States, there are, are not a lot of money laundering cases made, even when they are connected to Mexican criminal organization. I remember um, the investigation at the HSBC. They were moving huge amounts of money. I mean, in the hundreds of millions, and this was all documented. They did get a fine. I can't remember what the fine was, but you didn't see anybody going to jail or anything. This is one of the biggest banks in the world. Wells Fargo, they calculated, they'd moved something in the range of $4 billion. So it's there, but there's not a lot of effort around it because there's really not a lot of incentive around it. I mean, imagine if they start going after things such as real estate, the real estate market in New York or the real estate market in London, you know, Miami, all of those huge real estate markets, there's no one really addressing that question. It's not like there's a lot of incentive for people to be poking around in those spaces and knocking down people who are perhaps from a politician's perspective, these are the industries that you're dependent on. So in a way, there's really great disincentives to going after these large movements of money into certain parts of the economy, the, the layers and layers of, of means by which you can launder the proceeds also has, has made it uh, significantly more difficult to make these cases. So, you know, they're, they're very expensive. They take a long time. You got to have people who really understand these systems. The systems are changing constantly. So it's not like it's an easy thing either. I don't want to make it out to be like that. But, but certainly there's, there's a need to put more resources in that direction. Another strategy I've seen proposed a few times is one of consolidation. 
See, we currently do something similar with Afghanistan, as right now the US is currently propping up and supporting the Taliban government inside Kabul, as we know that if the Taliban were to collapse, the forces that would likely replace them would be far, far worse. So what would happen if we adopted a similar strategy here? That the US pick one cartel, probably one of the less violent and more amenable ones, back them with everything from guns to intelligence to immunity, and then set them loose to consolidate the market and wipe out the other cartels. And once they have 100% dominance of the market, then try and curb them from there. Is this most likely to prove somewhat successful like in Afghanistan, or will it turn out disastrous like when the US tried this in Haiti? If you ask you know, some analysts in Mexico, they will say that they, <laughs> this has been tried. In certain spaces, there was a time period in which a lot of people believed, and certainly some of the judicial cases, including the recent case against the top police officer, illustrated a intimate connection between security forces and some of these criminal groups, in particular the Sinaloa cartel. And this played out, for example, in, in Ciudad Juarez about a decade ago, a little bit more than a decade ago. And, you know, it was one of these things where the notion was they had these connections to the federal police officers. And one of the first things that the Sinaloa cartel did when they arrived in, in Juarez and sort of launched their war against the, you know, what was then known as the Juarez cartel, was they killed about a half dozen policemen and put out a, a, a message near the bodies, basically naming all these other policemen because they understood that the power of the Juarez cartel, at least in part, was related to their intimate relationship with the security forces, but the local security forces. So basically the Sinaloa cartel arrived with the federal forces and the local group, the Juarez cartel, was working with the local forces. So this is played out in, in certain respects in these very important corridors like the Juarez. And for a very long time, there was this very strong and, and violent criminal group called the Sitas. And a lot of the activity to sort of suppress them was thought to be in conjunction with some of the other criminal groups because the Sittas were like known to be the most violent and you know really it kind of upset the apple cart in a lot of a lot of respects sort of broke all the rules and really sort of made life difficult for everybody so everyone kind of aligned themselves against them and to a certain extent it worked the Sittas were very much decimated they were a different type of group than, than the Sinaloa cartel. I mean, much more dependent on controlling territory. In fact, their roots were, were military in and of themselves. So they were a little bit more susceptible to being pushed around in a military way. But that was, in essence, part of the strategy. So it wouldn't be the the craziest thing to happen in terms of these things that, that happen in, in places like Mexico. I don't know if the Sinaloa cartel would be a good uh, strategic ally, because again, like I said, they're probably divided up uh, even amongst themselves. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult now. These groups are increasingly atomized. So it would be a little harder to find your big champion to wipe out everybody else. I think an overarching question we haven't approached here yet is what incentive do the governments of Mexico and Colombia have to fully crack down on the drug trade? As for drug use, most of these drugs end up in the US rather than Mexico, and much of the money made from this drug trade actually ends up back in the Mexican economy through the black or grey markets. So economically, what incentive do these governments have to actually fully end the drug trade? And how much of this drug money ends up back in the Mexican economy? The high point of, of the Colombian cartels, you know, you're talking about anywhere between 5 and 10% of the GDP. You could make pretty big guesses like that it's in the billions. We are doing rough calculations today of what we thought the fentanyl market was worth in the United States. And, you know, we're in the range of $6 billion. You know, that's wholesale market in the United States. That's not what these guys are bringing home. But it could just give you a sense, just that one market, just the United States, you know, so there's quite a bit of money involved here. And, you know, some of it certainly goes back into Mexico. And, and that was part of the mythic narrative was that this was supporting what is what is arguably the breadbasket of, 
of Mexico. I mean, Sinaloa is an extremely important agricultural hub for the country. So you could say, oh, well, you know, they're not hurting but anybody here. And they're also helping to a certain extent in these spaces where there isn't anybody. So it's part of the mythic narrative. What's happening now with, with, with synthetics is, is something different because they no longer have that, what, what they would call arraigo, right? The roots, you know, uh, that connection to those spaces because they're, they're producing stuff synthetically in these labs and they're actually playing a decently large role in, in destroying the environment in many cases because of these rudimentary rural meth labs that are proliferating in these places like Sinaloa. They don't employ nearly the same number of people and meth is now the number one cause of people going into rehab centers in Mexico now. So it's going to be interesting to see how long they can continue to live on this old mythic narrative. This isn't your dad's cartel, so to say. And that's also kind of playing out in, in the money side because now the money is increasingly going to these urban spaces. You know, not that it was flowing back into these peasant communities by any stretch, but in essence that the plant-based drug market was supporting a good number of people in many respects around different parts of the country, not just in the Golden Triangle area. So for my final question, if I were to make you the US president, how would you actually address this issue? This isn't a question of ending drugs or illicit economies. This is about addressing the most acute problems, which, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about violence. And then on the other hand, we're talking about overdoses. So certainly putting a lot of effort there. You've got a couple of fires that you really need to address. And then you've got to figure out how to deal with these longer term issues. And, you know, some of them go way beyond drug trafficking, obviously. You could be dealing with uh, trying to create some sort of more holistic approach. And then on the, the sort of security side, we start putting more money into following the money. You're not going to end this by simply plucking out different parts of the distribution chain, which is essentially what's happening now. You arrest people in different parts of the distribution chain and they're just very easily replaced. So you need to kind of think outside of the box a little bit or at least put resources in spaces where you, you can squeeze people and squeeze politicians and make sure businesses aren't connected to this and do different types of things like that on the, on the enforcement side. So once again, we arrive at the conundrum of how to solve the drug problem. And looking at all the obvious answers that we think of first, none of them work. You can't stop precursor chemicals coming into the US because they're also the chemicals that have legitimate purposes. And by barring them from entry, you just become more likely to kill off any industry that relies on these chemicals. It also won't solve the majority of the problem as most of the chemicals don't enter the US and instead are sent directly to Mexico from either India or China. And because they're coming into Mexico, along with millions and millions of other tons of additional cargo, it makes it almost impossible to track. You can't solve this problem by brute force either, as it ends up like smashing a beehive with a sledgehammer. The whilst it might look like you've done something, what you've actually done is just split everything into lots of smaller threats that are all now harder to isolate and control as they turn against you. You can't go the opposite way with it either and try and consolidate the problem by backing just one player as the US actually tried that in Haiti, where the US backed the G9 gang, and whilst yes, they did knock out a lot of the competition and make it easier for outside forces to deal with, as there's only one set of leadership now, this group also gained a whole lot of wealth and used that wealth to build up parts of the community. And after watching G9 build up parts of the state and not have their forces come under attack, they became so powerful that it delegitimized the national government, creating an even more lawless situation with gangsters in control rather than the national government. And because of this, the US had to start over and go back to square one. So that option probably won't work for Mexico either. The US can't even go after their money as the money is often tied up in legitimate businesses or in real estate in London, New York, or LA, along with all the other white collar crime and Russian money laundering, as well as billionaire tax cheats. And these are all groups the US usually avoids going after and for years has systematically defunded the groups that would do so. So currently no resources are available to be tracking drug money across multiple continents. The US couldn't even effectively go down the Trump's war route, even if the US were to take Trump's war concept to the extreme and build a North Korea DMZ style minefield separating the United States and Mexico, that option is very unlikely to work as the US-Mexico border is way longer than the Korea's one and being in the middle of the desert, 
much harder to build and supply in. B. Tunnels along the US-Mexico border have become commonplace, making the whole DMZ redundant. And C. And probably most importantly, most drugs actually enter the US through legal means, such as hidden cargo and legitimate crossings, through the mail or in shipping containers, meaning that even taking the war concept to its absolute extreme would be nothing but a huge waste of money. But if we try to move where the drugs are coming in, and start inspecting every container as it comes to the cargo ports, that is only likely to cause even more problems, as with current infrastructure you can't up the inspections of ports, as inspections cause delays, and every hour you keep a container at port begins a cascading backlog of cargo, as whilst that container sits on the dock waiting to be inspected, other containers can't be put on the dock, and it only takes a few days of slight delays before the problem starts exponentially growing. And at that point, if you're a European port like Antwerp, people begin leaving your port for another one like Rotterdam. And these delays in getting goods off the ships cause massive problems for businesses waiting for these products to be able to sell. And these supply shortages and problems have rippling effects throughout the entire economy. And that's just upping the inspections by a little bit, let alone trying to inspect every single container as it comes through the port. You can't even fight this like a guerrilla war anymore and bomb the facilities you know are making drugs as these days the process has become way more decentralized, and with fentanyl gone are the days of good targets like super labs, and instead probably just means hitting a garage with two people and a $300 pill press. And even if you get that one, there may even be hundreds more across the neighborhood, making any individual strike hardly worth the expensive airstrike and intel gathering. You see, the obvious answer comes back to supply and demand, because no matter how much we try to impact the supply, the demand is still growing, and less supply simply means higher prices paid from the demand, which therefore means more dealers entering the market. If you lower demand, you lower supply. If you lower supply, you simply just drive up the price of demand. What the US needs to do is find a way to lower the demand for drugs throughout the United States. We spoke with several experts about this particular topic, and there are plenty of drug harm reduction options, legalization options, rehabilitation options, and community outreach options available. But due to YouTube and Spotify's rules about advocating for certain drug use, on this program, I won't be able to go into too much detail about these ones. All I will say though, is that these may be the only way to actually curb the demand side of the problem, and have been proven effective when tried out in other countries. But even if I could advocate for it here, being a close observer of US politics, I'm pretty pessimistic that it would ever get implemented. As we've all seen firsthand what happens when politicians propose even the most basic steps towards solving the problem, like clean needle programs or injection sites. And I think I'm sadly aware that politically, the chance of any of these options being taken seriously is still a fair way from entering political mainstream, even if the facts would suggest that this probably is the only way forward. But until we can put politics aside and address the root of this frankly economic issue, we are going to continue swinging that sledgehammer of this beehive, just making things worse. Punishing the addicts, and empowering the criminals. We will continue using a military solution for what should be an economics problem. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. We've wanted to do this piece for quite a while now, but have always ummed and ahed on how controversial it might be. So we wanted to make sure we got everything right. But even after all this research and work, we tripped up right at the end with me getting a nasty bout of food poisoning on the final day of recording. So, if you're wondering why this episode's a few hours late, well, now you know. To avoid this happening again in a fortnight's time, I'll do my best to avoid eating Thai food for a while, so that way we can get back to our usual schedule. If you wanted to hear why this episode was delayed ahead of time, or be kept up to date with everything else we're up to, you can either visit our website at www.theredlinepodcast.com, or you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok, on the handle at the Red Line Pod, or if you can follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliot Oz, Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help myself and the team keep this show going. And speaking of our amazing Patreons, this week I'd like to thank Mary E. Dolan, James Lawrence, Matthew Zelaski, Pat, and Bettina Bauer, who are the latest Patreons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like these guys, and we are eternally grateful for their support and belief in the show. So if you feel you could spare a couple of dollars and like what we do here at the show, we'd greatly appreciate it. But for now, this episode on the Mexican cartels is all thanks to you guys. <laughs>
As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is The Dope, The Real History of the Mexican Drug Trade by Benjamin T. Smith, taking you through the history of the drug trade here. The second is Kleptopia, my friend of the show, Tom Burgess, for a look at how dirty money gets cleaned and cycled through the economy. And the third is Fentanyl Inc. by Ben Westoff, all about fentanyl's impact on the regional drug trade. I want to give a huge thanks as well to this week's guests, Jorge Castaneda, Vanda Falba Brown, Scott Missler Ferguson, and Stephen Dudley. All of you were absolutely fantastic and so forthcoming with your data and explanations of the situation, and we cannot thank you enough for all your help with this episode. I also want to thank my staff, Wade McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniel Zavella, Genevieve Donald and May, Nate Ostilla, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter-Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al-Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tano, MD director, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Derek Henry Flood, our deputy editor, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick March, our field correspondent. For probably the 92nd time on the show, I have to keep stressing how great this team is, and I couldn't do this program without them. The Red Line, we back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.